Part 5. The New Home A wild and broken landscape, spiked with firs, roughening the bleak horizon's northern edge. Steep cavernous hillsides where black hemlock spurs and sharp gray splinters of the wind-swept ledge pierce the thin glazed ice or bristling rose where the cold rim of the sky sunk down upon the snows. And eastward cold, wide marshes stretched away, dull, dreary flats without a bush or tree, or crossed by icy creeks where twice a day gurgled the waters of the moon-struck sea. And faint with distance came the stifled roar the melancholy lapse of waves on that low shore. No cheerful village with its mingling smokes, no laugh of children wrestling in the snow, no campfire blazing through the hillside oaks, no fishers kneeling on the ice below. Yet midst all desolate things of sound and view, through the long winter moons, smiled dark-eyed Weedamoo, her heart had found a home, and freshly all its beautiful affections overgrew their rugged prop. As o'er some granite wall, soft vine leaves open to the moistening dew and warm bright sun, the love of that young wife found on a hard, cold breast the dew and warmth of life. The steep, bleak hills, the melancholy shore, the long, dead level of the marsh between, a coloring of unreal beauty wore through the soft golden mist of young love seen. For o'er those hills and from that dreary plain, nightly she welcomed home her hunter chief again. No warmth of heart, no passionate burst of feeling, repaid her welcoming smile and parting kiss. No fond and playful dalliance half concealing under the guise of mirth its tenderness. But in their stead the warriors settled pride, and vanity's pleased smile with homage satisfied. Enough for Weedamoo that she alone sat on his mat and slumbered at his side, that he whose fame to her young ear had flown now looked upon her proudly as his bride that he whose name the Mohawk trembling heard vouchsafed to her at times a kindly look or word. For she had learned the maxims of her race, which teach the women to become a slave and feel herself the pardonless disgrace of love's fond weakness in the wife and wise and brave, the scandal and the shame which they incur who give to women all which men requires of her. So passed the winter moons. The sun at last broke link by link. The frost chain of the rills and the warm breathings of the southwest passed over the hoar rime of the Saugus Hills. The gray and desolate marsh grew green once more, and birch trees' tremulous shade fell round the sachem's door. Then from far Penacook swift runners came, with gift and greeting for the Saugus chief, beseeching him in the great Sachem's name that with the coming of the flower and leaf, the song of birds, the warm breeze and the rain, young Weetamu might greet her lonely sire again. And Wyndham Perkett called his chiefs together, and a grave council in his wigwam met, solemn and brief in words, considering whether the rigid rules of for forest etiquette permitted Weedamu once more to look upon her father's face and green-banked Panacook. With interludes of pipe smoking and strong water, the forest sages pondered, and at length concluded in a body to escort her up to her father's home of pride and strength. Impressing thus on Pentecook a sense of Winnipeg's power and regal consequence.
So through old woods, which I'll keep in its hand, a soft, she's sleeping on the couch, and many shaded greenness lent over high breezy hills and meadow land yellow with flowers, the wild procession went till rolling down its wooded banks between a broad clear mountain stream, the Merrimack was seen. The hunter leaning on his bow undrawn, the fisher lounging on the pebbled shores, squaws in the clearing dropping the seed corn, young children peering through the wigwam doors, saw with delight surrounding, surrounded by her train of painted saugus braves their Weetamoo again.